Hello, everybody. And this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm so excited because we have a very special guest with us today. It's David Roylance. He is a remarkable individual. He is an author and he also is a voice coach. He's a specialist when it comes to voice. And he's going to explain more about that. But it's very interesting. He has a lot of different things to tell you about today that you could use in your everyday life to enhance yourself and elevate you yourself to new levels. So David, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stacey. I, I am a multiple Amazon bestselling author. Uh, my main piece is a book named Be Seen, Be Heard, Get Paid What You're Worth. And it's, it's key for me when I'm working with people that they do get paid what they are worth. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of my clients are, are women uh, who are in some way stuck and often surrounded by men who are not listening to them. And I help them develop a powerful voice, a voice that perhaps in a boardroom or in front of an audience uh, makes people listen and makes people see someone who's key. Yes. Uh, and that normally, uh, you know, and a uh, key and valuable, that's a huge thing. Yes. I, during lockdown I, in 2020, I got an award from Women in Banking and Finance, who I have a very close relationship with, uh, and they named me one of the top 40 uh, people globally uh, helping women to get promotions within the banking space. Yeah. And so uh, I like to think of myself as an award-winning co coach in, in that respect. I, as, as, this all came from me uh, com coming down to London in the early 90s and having a three-year drama training as a professional actor, working as a professional actor, working and running my own theatre company, and then uh, discovering that I needed to make money rather than throw money away. And... Uh, found that people really resonated with my message around the voice. Wow. And that's, a, that's a, where it all kind of springs from, really. I, when, I, when I was at drama college, I was there um, in Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London, one of the top three conservatoire trainings in the world at that time. Uh, and I was I was there with Daniel Craig, and I was there with Ewan McGregor, who I used to share a flat with uh, for six months, and Damien Lewis, and, and names you can conjure with. And, yeah. and but most importantly, I met a lady named Patsy Rodenberg, and uh, I had a three-year professional voice training from her. Patsy's the world's number one, and. And, you know, she has a school in New York and uh, she was the national theater voice coach. Uh, and she did work with Barack Obama in his first presidential election campaign. Wow. I find that really intriguing. You know, it was funny because like earlier we, before the show began, we were talking about how voice and how we how we exemplify our, our voice has such an impact on on society yes. and you know a lot of times people will say things and they will say it the way they think it should be heard and they ha they haven't really you know looked at their audience or looked at the person they're speaking to and really get an idea of what type of characteristics that person has who that person is you know and because a lot of times if you want to be successful if you want to do well if you want to develop a good relationship with a person you have to understand who they are and then speak to them so they are um, compliant and they, res they respect you and they will have a, a feeling of bond. So th And then you could have a more yes. meaningful conversation. And whatever your goal is in that conversation, you can reach that goal if you voice and speak to and speak in a way that's going to resonate with that other individual. Do you feel the same way? I do indeed, and that is something that can only happen if you are present in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, to have presence for other people, you have to be present in yourself. And we, in through life, we're going to meet lots of people who are not present in them, themselves because they're deep in their own head. 
Yeah. And, and maybe they're operating from fear or maybe they're operating from scarcity. But what they present to you of themselves is not authentic. Right. Uh, so, um, there are there are three different spaces that human beings can occupy at any one time. But only one of those three spaces is a space of being present in yourself. So there's, uh, I think of them as circles, mm -hmm. circles of energy that we emanate and say that the first circle of energy is the, is the kind of energy that we use when we're trying to be invisible, mm -hmm. when we hope that nobody notices us, yes. where we go, you know, really inside. And that's like, it's the flight element of, of fight or flight. Yes. Um, and then there's, uh, I, and, and so that makes people go backwards and that, and that changes their energy and it makes it very hard. So it's a stress default for a lot of people. And what the science tells us it's, is actually that first circle of energy, that desire to be invisible is more likely to be a female stress okay. default than a male stress default. So it's not hard and fast, but uh, much more likely that, uh, when women are in, in conversations or in a boardroom or they're uncomfortable, they'll go back into that space, which then makes it hard to get a voice out mm. because your energy is going back. Right. And then there's at the very front, there's this kind of what I call the convincing state which, where it's all a little bit too loud and a little bit too pushy, which is which is more of the fight aspect of fight or flight. Yeah. And that's, that's very much more likely to be a male stress default. Yes. Where, and, and, and I think of it of, <laughs> at, at all of those times that I've been sold to very badly. Yeah. By somebody who's trying to convince me that their product or their service is what I need. And it makes, you know, like you were saying about that kind of bond the, yeah. between you and the uh, and the person who's doing <laughs> the selling or the or, or the communicating none of that is possible when you're in either those either of those two spaces yeah and so there's a point in the middle where you are in a state of presence mm -hmm. and because you're in a state of you're present in yourself and the way that you can tell that you're present in yourself is you're breathing in your stomach, not your chest. Oh, very interesting. So if the breath is in the chest, what will happen is the heart, which is the, the organ pretty much in charge of how much brain power you have, mm -hmm. the heart will start sending signals to the hypothalamus at the back of the brain. Yes. Going, you're not, you're not safe right now. And what the hypothalamus does is go, oh, okay, and then takes all of the oxygen from the frontal lobe of the brain and stores it here. Wow. Very back, because it's not evolved in any way since we lived in caves. Right. So when the hypothalamus gets the signal, it thinks saber-toothed tiger. Mm-hmm. Right? It, 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 it has no complicated idea of, wh of whether we're in a you know level one danger or level three danger it just goes no nope. the sucking of the oxygen and the holding it here is so that you can do a big sprint to get away from the danger wow so, so often when i talk to people they res resonate with this idea that have you ever been in a meeting or you've been on the receiving end of some uh, feedback and it's been pretty unpleasant. You can't think of anything to say, but the moment that meeting's over and you're out the door and in the corridor, suddenly you think of six, seven really yes. clever things you should have said or could have said in that room. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's, it, the, the French call it the, the spirit of the staircase, l'esprit d'escalier. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that idea that suddenly you, you're out of danger and suddenly all that oxygen comes back to the frontal lobe where you do all of your clever thinking. Okay. And you, wow. then you recover everything. In That's the same so way, interesting. Actors, actors who forget lines on stage, just fear, just the hypothalamus going, well, if he forgets everything, he'll walk off stage. 
and then he'll be safe from this danger. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that is so interesting. I find that fascinating, actually. And it makes sense, you know, but it, it's just the it, what I find so interesting is the way our body functions and how we react to things. And people don't realize it, you know, it all goes back to science and it goes back to the way our brain functions and and how we protect ourselves as individuals. So, you know, if you're with a person who you trust and you and you you can relate to, you kind of let the wall down, you know. But if yes. you feel, you know, that that maybe this person is a threat in some way, the wall comes up. And then you just react just like you would if you were in a forest and all of a sudden you hear noise behind a tree, you know, you're going to react. What can I do to protect myself just in case, you know? And yes. I think that's, that's such, that's such a fascinating, um, you know, it, it's so interesting the way we respond, you know, to voice and, and body language and even the energies, you know, sometimes you could be with a person and you can pick up that negative energy or something's not right. And you don't may you may not necessarily know what it is, but you could feel that that negativity, that energy. Or sometimes you're with someone and and you can feel the positivity and you know that this person is just full of greatness because you could feel it, you know. And uh I find it so interesting. If you really it, it seems like what I've learned throughout my years practicing, you know, different exercises and learning about myself and how I function. I find that when when you when you work with people and you understand when you understand yourself you tend to pick up more on about the other person you're able to understand yes. people and then when you're able to understand people I think the the communic communication or the the voice between each other kind of strengthens and you know and you have a better um, better chance of bonding and working through a situation or even, you know, being able to perform better. Like you showed the example of a, of an actor who gets so nervous and he's breathing from his chest that he forgets all his lines and he walks off stage. You know, I think it's the same way in the working world and it's the same way oh, with, with the company too. And I've, I've had a lot of clients who I've had a, like a phone call to bring them to a state of, of presence before they've gone in for a 360 from their manager, when previously they've gone for a 360 from their manager and they've come out feeling appalling about themselves. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it's to get, if you're in a state of presence in yourself, then your antenna, if you like, the, all, all the other senses yeah. that, that we mainly don't understand, that how we pick up all that information yeah. in such a short space of time in order to work out, am I safe in this conversation? Am I yeah. safe with this person? Uh, none of that happens at a conscious level. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's all it's all the stuff that we don't really know yet about that we like. You, that's how you pick up that energy of knowing, uh, you know, what is this person a negative person to have in a space or, uh, you, you know, recognizing what emanates from someone who presents confidence through the uh, through the act of being present, because it's like it's a position of strength and a position of vulnerability at the same time. Right. Whereas if, if someone's in that third circle space of being convincing and sort of pushing forward, it's it's like a, a show. It's like wearing a mask that isn't true. Right. Right. No. And I, I, I've done a, Patsy Rodenberg, my uh, my first mentor in the world of the voice. She did a lot a lot of research into these three circles. She taught right. them to me, and in particular, she did a lot of work with uh, young people who had been abused or bullied. Okay. And the symbiotic nature the the bully is always third circle, and the person who's being bullied goes into first circle. Okay. So what often okay. happens, this happens a lot in the corporate world as well. A lot of a lot all the bullies do third circle, see that they can create first circle in others and go, oh, there's a strategy that works. Mm -hmm. So I'll just do that more. 
Right, right, right. And create more of these little people who are going into hiding because that surely that means I'm respected. Yeah. And actually, it's it, it's it's nonsense. So uh, she's done a lot of work with uh, uh, with young people, getting them to be in a position of presence, hold that what I call that second circle uh, presence state yeah. in front of their bully. And then get and then she rehearses them to say the words, I know what you did. Oh, Very simply. Wow. The bully always crumbles. Really? Because He's it's caught. a facade. It's always a facade. And the moment that people are together in a state of presence, magic is possible. Wow, that's really interesting. So when it comes to entrepreneurs, what yes. kind of examples or what kind of techniques or strategies do you try to teach or suggest that they could do? Maybe they could apply it even at home and to, to gain those skills. So when they do have to go maybe one-on-one -on -one with a person or in a group of people, they can present themselves in a way where they'll come off positively, they'll come off strong, and they'll come off you know the way that they need to in order to succeed and excel in that conversation. Now, the first thing I do is I, I would want them standing at their actual height. Mm -hmm. Most people crunch their spine and, and yeah. are smaller than they really are in this world. Or if they're, if, if they're in the third circle, they're sort of put, pushing forward. Now, and the reason that that's important is we have to get the breath really low mm -hmm. in the abdomen, in, right at the bottom of the stomach, in order to be able to get the voice moving. Right. So I do, I do a lot of work with, uh, with the Alexander technique, which is, uh, I, I, are you familiar with that, Stacey? No, I'm not actually. So the Alexander te technique came, it came from an actor whose name was Alexander, and it's and and in, he was in the 19th century, and he 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 was touring, doing three hour long Shakespeare's every night, uh, drinking, carousing, eating after the show, going to bed, waking up, no voice, uh, and and this would happen every day for a period of time, and. He went, you know, this is terrible. I'm in a state of anxiety every day, not speaking to anybody in the fear that I won't be able to do my job in the evening. Wow. And so he began examining what he was doing. And he came up with this, uh, which, which is now known as the Alexander Technique. It's a system of understanding tension associated with the spine that, and tension anywhere in the spine will trap the breath in the chest. Wow. And the moment the breath is in the chest, you can only use about a third of your natural range. Wow. So you, the, the influence, when I talk about, you know, when, when we're making first impressions or when we're picking up first impressions from people. Yes. Um, Professor Alan Pease, the, who's a body language expert, he's the body language expert who wrote the body language book that he called the body language book. <laughs> In his book, he says it takes 23 seconds to form an opinion that is then difficult to shift. Mm, I believe it. Right. And I say um, men typically make decisions in seven seconds. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's because men have got more neural pathways behind the eyes. Wow. Right. Women 14 because female neur neural pathways are more evenly spread through the brain. Wow. Uh, but 23 seconds is when we go, no, I've got enough information. This person's a waste of time. Right. Or, I've got enough information. This person's really good. So we, we focus a lot on, uh, you know, what's the impression you're creating in that first 23 seconds? Yeah. And, and how little of that is to do with the content of what you're saying mm -hmm. whether, or whether you're presenting yourself in a way that puts people at ease. Right. And makes go, I'm, I'm completely safe here. I can listen yeah. to this. And so vocal tonality is key. 
Mm-hmm. And by that, I mean movement of the voice tonally is key because when you're listening to a voice, it's how, again, the hypothalamus is hard at work to try and find out if it's safe to be in a conversation with this person or it's safe to listen to this person's voice. Yeah. And the hypothalamus is listening for tonal movement because tonal movement means emotional engagement, which means they're telling the truth. Right. So when there's no tonal movement at all, the hypothalamus goes, not safe, not safe. Right. Which is why if, if, if you've ever in your life, Stacey, been in a, um, a lecture that's being run by someone who's speaking on a monotone, yeah. Mm-hmm. It doesn't take as long to to disconnect and not be able to listen to that person. Very true. Yeah. You know, your your own uh, safety mechanism is go, is going. I can't tell if they're telling the truth. Don't listen to them. Don't listen right. to them. Yeah, that's true. Right. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to get the posture right so that we can then work on the voice. And so one exercise that I do with people is I say to them, I'd like you to imagine you've got a piece of string starting in the very base of your spine that runs through every single vertebra in your spine right into the skull through the top of your head. And it runs all the way up through the ceiling of the room you're in to the floor above. And I'd like you to imagine that in the floor above, you've got a puppeteer who's holding that piece of string like that. Wow. Now, it's very important that nobody try and do anything or nobody act. But just the, the, the beauty is that your unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between that which is real and that which is imagined. Right. So if you imagine something, then it goes, oh, OK. Right. If you imagine you've got that piece of string there, you don't have to do anything. You imagine you've got that puppeteer on the floor above. And and then I say, and so the puppeteer on the floor above just does that. They just pull the string absolutely taut. Oh, and then I get them walking. (laughs) So (laughs) find out what it's like to walk at their true height. Right. How it feels to be walking at that true height. And what happens is people start making eye contact Mm -hmm. because they're now in a state of presence. They're not, they're not faking their height. They're not denying their height. Right. Uh, And people deny their height. Have you heard of the uh, um, Australian expression, uh, tall poppy? No, 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 I haven't. So in Australia, they say you don't want to be a tall poppy because you get your head chopped off right? (laughs) because the gardeners go around making sure that all the puppies are are equal height (laughs) right so if one stands out they go cut off right so there's this whole thing of i don't want to be a tall puppy because i'll get you know my head chopped off someone will chop my head off so (laughs) then people deny their height and now here's the thing i mean um this this happened in the year 2011, which in the in the UK was uh, year three of, of a recession. Mm-hmm. And I, I was working for somebody else at the time, and I, and I was working with the Royal Bank of Scotland, mm-hmm. uh, with the Treasury Department. I'd helped their uh, financial director move from another bank into position. Right. And he, he got me in to work with his uh, team. And, and it was the weirdest morning that I've ever had. Mm-hmm. And uh, because I, I was delivering all this stuff and nobody was listening to me, yeah. something was too much up. Um, and uh, as I was leaving, the phone rang and it was the people I was working for. And they said, what the hell have you done, David? We, we've just been fired. Mm-hmm. We've just had fax canceling the entire uh, contract what what happened and I'm like I don't know but it was really weird and nobody was really listening and nobody was doing the exercises uh, and, and so then it went quiet for about three months and then they called me again and said oh the RBS want to 
uh, start the contract again. They want to see you. So I went back in and started working with their people. And the financial director who I was, uh, I, I was wor- working with, I, he and I went for lunch. Mm-hmm. We sat having lunch and I said, well, what happened there? Because yeah. you, we, were, we were doing fine and then you fired us and now you, mm-hmm. a few months later, we're back. What happened? He went, oh, well, uh, we didn't want to waste money having you train people we were going to get rid of. Oh, wow. And then he said these words, not pleasant words either. He said, um, since then, we've culled about a third of the company. And I, I asked him, how did you do that? How did, what, what criteria did you use for choosing? Yeah. And he, he said these words to me. He said, we looked for the people with their heads down and we fired them. No, really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So there's an element of if you're not trying to create some visibility around yourself, they see you as dead weight. Wow. Because they don't understand what value. That's you could, amazing. Right. So even in the entrepreneur world, you can you can be uh, the most amazing next thing. But if you if you're not creating the right visibility about yourself, you cannot be influential in whatever your, uh, your world is. Yeah, you you've got to be seen and you've got to be seen in a way that puts people at ease, whether, um, you know, whether whether you're in a one to one conversation, whether you're networking in a small group, whether you're speaking to an audience of 100, 1000, whether you're speaking to a million people on a podcast. Wow. Right. It's still got to be about making people feel at ease yes. because and now more than ever in 2024 around the world, we've had crisis after crisis after crisis after crisis. Yes. And people's hypothalamuses are really tired of the crises. Yeah. Now, I had a word with uh, women in banking and finance last week. And they were saying it's really bad, like 40% of our membership are going, it's too hard. I don't think we're going to bother anymore. I I think I'll just leave Uh, or I'll just keep my head down. Uh, And so what they're feeling is that the advancements that they've made for women in the banking space are all are all coming back down. Yeah. They're all coming back down because this just oof, oof, people are tired. Yeah. Now, what it does mean is that things are much more a buyer's market than they've ever been, mm-hmm. which means people don't want to be sold to, especially sold to badly. Yes. People want to feel, uh, I get to make this decision for myself. Mm hmm. And as long as they feel I'm in a position where I can make a decision for myself, I'm not going to get pushed. I'll stay in the conversation. Yes. But the moment someone goes and it's, uh, and it's only that price till Friday. Right. They're like, I don't care. I'm out. Mm -hmm. Because again, the hypothalamus is now going, not safe. Get out. Right. So, People, I think, need a lot more nurturing and a lot more time to know that they're safe. Yeah. Like, for instance, you may have noticed that I'm doing this with you today in a standing position rather than a sitting position. Actually, I didn't notice that. I didn't. I'm standing. Now I notice it. Yeah, now I notice it. Yeah, you're going to take a step back. So the the thing is... um, we're on we're on a video platform rather than in the same room you're you're in the us and i'm in the uk right yeah our conscious minds know that stacy but our unconscious minds don't yeah yeah so the unconscious mind is busy trying to find all the information that it would get were you and i in the same room right and and so the more that you can the more you can give it yeah the easier it is to build rapport. And, and of course, the unconscious mind is always looking at hands. 
the, the conscious mind follows eyes and the unconscious mind follows hands. Wow. So, and, and particularly the palm of the hand. Mm. So it's interesting. If you ever notice what happens when someone's hands disappear, when you're in a face-to-face like, -face conversation, when someone's yeah. hands mm -hmm. go on them, it's something, there's a little bit of the brain going, what are they doing with their hands? Yeah, yeah. The hypothalamus going, no, no. What's take a step back, walk away, walk away. Yeah. And, and so it's like, and I did a lot of this in the period that we were all in lockdown together when it, when people were really struggling with rapport building over Zoom. Right. And I'd start by saying, well, st stop letting people see up your nose. That's the first <laughs> thing I'd say to you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But lots of people were were in that space and, and, and then create this space where you, you can do it from a standing position and give people a sense of who you are. Movement is always good, kind of three dimensionality. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and of course, the same thing is true when you're doing video content for, um, for your audience, you know, right. that you, you want to give people a sense uh, of what it would be like to be with you. Yeah. And so that they have a clear understanding of, would I like to be with that energy? Yeah. Would, would I be comfortable? Would I be happy in the same room as that energy? Right, right. And so what happens, people, people self-select in or out it kind of doesn't matter it's kind of it's you and your audience helping each other to find out whether they want to spend more time with you right that's very interesting is it's uh and it's so true you know when, when i would speak with people i i would especially if i'm in a room with someone and either if they're sitting down if they have their arms or their legs crossed I feel that's a, a defensive mode where they're trying to protect themselves or they've already made their minds up. A lot of times yeah. when someone already has like, you know, their hands crossed or their legs crossed, it usually shows a sign that no matter what you say to me, it's going to be this way, you know? And, uh, I, you know, so it, it, it is, it is remarkable. And I, I was talking to someone about body language the other day and, you know, they're like, they, they understood it, but they were like, how do you know, you know, because your body's react in a certain way. You're sometimes subconsciously, we, we move our body a certain way. And, and the person, you know, I think they kind of got lost on the subconscious part. Like, you know, if yeah. you're not purposely doing, doing it, you know, how do you really know that person is thinking that, you know? And I'm, you know, and I, I said, because you're subconscious and that's where they got lost. And they, they, they couldn't grasp that, our body moves or reacts a, a certain way sometimes subconsciously that we're not telling it what to do. It just subconsciously just reacts. Well, it's got to work fast. You know, the, that's the point. The unconscious mind works really, really fast. It's really complex. And we never get to find out what it's doing unless, you know, un unless we really find out what's what the stories are that we're uh, that we're telling ourselves that yeah. kind of limit what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, yes. And are you familiar with the work of Virginia Satir? No, I'm not actually. She's, a, she's an amazing woman, but and she um, she her work came out of the world of family therapy and working with families that were going through uh, very difficult times. And her work was uh, essentially stolen uh, by a couple of people uh, called Bandler and Grinder. Oh, wow. Who, who then created NLP out of the work that they'd learned from her. <laughs> oh, wow. So she's, she's a fascinating person to kind of di dive into, but she, she identified that there are, um, five gesture patterns that universally have the same meaning mm -hmm. uh, everywhere in the world except Japan. Oh, really? Yeah, because in Japan, there's like, like the, the level of complexity on, uh, on gesture and physical meaning. Okay. Uh, shape, gesture, it's, it's so precise in, in Japan. It's a completely different game. Um, but she said these, 
everywhere, everywhere else in the world that you go, you will find, and particularly within a family, you'll find one person who, who goes into this space, one person who goes into that space. And, and um, the, the one with arms folded, she calls it the super reasonable. Oh, really? Yeah. And so it's like, it's like, I'm just having a little chat with myself. <laughs> so they're kind of, they're, they're having this sort of internal dialogue about yeah. what is being said or whatever it is that they've seen. And so actually in t attempting to engage with someone who's in that space, don't do it, waste of time. You have to wait for them to come out of it and, yes. and then you can find out what conclusion have they come to. Right. So, you know, they, um, I suppose the science term for it is audio digital, that, that sense of people who need to have a little chat with themselves before they venture an opinion. I, I, I find her work really remarkable in kind of helping, uh, because again, gesture pattern um, transforms the voice. Yes, very true. And the tonality that that you use. Yeah. Now, would it be useful if I shared with you as a voice specialist how I I break down the three uh, the 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 full voice into three different areas? Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. Three different purposes. So I'd like you to imagine that we all have a natural voice that we were born with, which has a huge range. Right. And we have a habitual voice, which is the voice that we've learned to use right. through childhood up to adulthood. And for many of us, it'll be, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. It will be about a third of the natural range. So we do a lot of work with my clients kind of really expanding that voice. So the natural range is happening and the voice is dancing naturally through all the different notes. Remember that leads us back to uh, people will will feel that safety of yes. the natural dance. Mm -hmm. So three voices in one, what I call the warrior voice, which is the lower notes in mm -hmm. the voice. The, vo the warrior voice is, uh, is the voice of professionalism. It's a factual voice. Mm -hmm. And you'll find when you get groups of men together, mm -hmm. they will all do what I call the low off, which, you know, in, in a bar on a Friday night. Right, right. Talking about the game. Mm -hmm. Men will then use their voice as an alpha domination and they'll form into a hierarchy on the basis of who's doing the lowest notes. Really? Very interesting. So credibility sits down here. And when you're using your warrior voice, you're more likely to accentuate consonant sounds rather than vowel sounds. Wow. That's why people think of it as factual, because emotion happens in the vowel sounds. Wow. Right, which is why people think of Americans as being much more emotional than British people, because the vowel sounds tend to be longer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so at the, at the bottom of the voice, you've got your warrior voice. In the center of your voice, you've got your heart voice. And your heart voice is the voice of rapport. Mm -hmm. It's the, the voice of taking an interest, asking questions, Hey, Stacy, how are you today? What's going on? Right? And, and, and you can hear with the moment you go up here, the more engaged you are, the, and the, the more the vowel sounds extend. Wow. So the, the more passionate we are about the thing that we speak about, the more we're going to extend the vowel sounds in the words that we speak. And that's one of the ways that people know they're telling the truth and they really mean it. Yeah. Now at the top of the voice, the highest notes, <laughs> what I call the head voice. Yeah. Right? Now, 
the same thing is true. Often when you get, when, particularly young women in a bar on a Friday night, you'll hear them forming a female alpha hierarchy with the highest notes of the voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, the thing about the head voice is it's really useful when you're speaking with groups mm -hmm. because it's big emotions. It's huge emotions. So if you're like, but if, if you have a team in your company and you want to get them really infused, then the head voice can be really useful. Can you imagine what we can create? Let's burn the midnight oil, make it happen. Yeah, yeah, we're all, you know, I'll buy everyone a pizza, woo! You know, <laughs> whatever it is to get kind of big emotions that then transfer ar around a room. So the head voice, very useful. I've heard, you, you know, for, particularly if you're selling from a stage, if you're an entrepreneur and there's value in selling from a stage and- yeah. The, the great value of selling from a stage is leverage of your time. Yeah. You know, if you've got a hundred of the perfect people in front of you and you can get the emotions high in that room and get people to buy into what's possible for them, yeah. then the head voice can be very useful. I do say to people, never use the head voice when you're in one-to-one -one conversation because it'll make people <laughs> want to go away. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Um, so we the focus is because people always ask yes but what how do how do i know when i should be using each voice and i say that if we if we focus on extending your range so that you've got access to it all it all will fall into place naturally mm. and because the last thing i want is a client of mine thinking about their voice when they're on the stage or they're in the podcast or they're making the videos or they're doing their TED talk, <laughs> right? I wouldn't want someone on a stage going, well, I wonder which voice I should be using. <laughs> what would David say? You know, I want, I want them to just be present and out there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Right? So you, that energy transference that happens when you're present, when an audience is present with you, if yeah. it's palpable, you can feel it, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I had a revelation when I was at drama school and I was working with Patsy Rodenberg again. She was uh, like one of the world's top Shakespeare uh, um, professors. And uh, she knows more about Shakespeare than probably anyone who's alive at the moment. And when she, uh, the, the, the big thing for me was when I was working on a monologue yeah. uh, from A Midsummer Night's Dream. And she said, she said to me, you're, you're playing this as a monologue. You're playing this as, um, as if you've got two pages of speech. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I went, yeah, yeah, that's probably true. And she said, you, you need to think of it as not as a monologue. You need to think of it as a duologue, except you're the only person speaking. Mm. Right yeah. now, who are you talking to? You're talking to the audience. You're talking to God. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. You choose. Right. right. It's a duologue. You don't know you're going to speak for two pages. Right. You're, you know, to be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> I'm putting it out there, right? <laughs> right. And it's, it's a duologue. There, there in Hamlet is a man who's asking God to give him an answer. What should I do? Yeah. Should I live or should I die? Right. And so it's a duologue between him and God. Yes, it's very interesting. And, and and so then I realized, yes, of course, everything where you're speaking to an audience, nothing, you know, and particularly if you're thinking, oh, I've got I've got a 30 minute or a 45 minute uh, speech that I need to do. And then people proceed into their text like, with, you know, what, what's your intention when you do this uh, to get it done as quickly as possible? <laughs> yeah, I can tell. <laughs> Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. That's yeah. what's coming over. But you don't want to think of any of that that way. You want to think about how much value can I give to my audience here? Exactly. Exactly. And, and then feed off the energy that they give you when yeah. something resonates, which which is why silence is a huge tool. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that people are often afraid of. You right. become comfortable with silence.
Yeah. That's very true. You, you can get the energy back. You can feel the energy. You can understand. That's so what's true. Going on here. Yes. Especially, in, you know, when, when you speak in front of groups or you're with a group of people, sometimes you can just look at their facial expressions and just know yes. exactly what they're thinking, what they like, what they dislike, just by the way their their facial expressions are, or if they have their hands on their finger and they seem like they're really into you, you know, or yes. you might have people, their eyes might be wandering, you know, and, you know, so you could kind of tell if you, you know, the person you're talking to or the group you're talking to, if you're resonating with that person, you know, that group, yes. that person, you know, are, are you on the right track, you know? And uh, I, I think that, you know, body language, facial expressions that comes with body language, but, you know, I, I and, and then, you know, sometimes when you have that energy and you, you, you do change that level of voice and you have that energetic, you know, that energy, I think resonates to the group, don't you think? And then it starts. Yeah, it does. It does. When, when you see people's faces at ease, you know, that you're, you're in, you're in the zone, you're in the right zone. And so when faces are tense and they're trying hard not to reveal yeah, yeah. what's going on, then, oh, something's going on here, right? Yeah. And, so, and that leaves you with the flexibility of what, what do you want to do with that, with that knowledge that something's not right here? You know, you can either pl plow on or you can be flexible. Right. I, I, I used to do, um, uh, I used to do some work on the sales team for one of my mentors uh, named Kane Menkes, yes. uh, who runs Industry Rockstar. And he's, he's marvelous. He's marvelous on the stage. But I saw him one day in the middle of a, a, in the middle of doing something, just go, right, there's a funny energy in the room. What's going on? <laughs> he, just, he just called it and went, no, what's going on? Something's happening. Talk to me, talk to me. And what he did was he forced the audience out of it and they started to tell him what was wrong and he went great now we can we can fix that because i know what it is yeah right exactly and i i like that approach i like that approach you know like sometimes like you know i was with a group of women and i was talking about something and they were interested but it didn't seem right and then i changed the subject a little over to something i thought they really would be interested in and all of a sudden their eyes you know got wide open and they started really you could see that okay i like this you know and then i knew this is the this is the right track, you know, just by, yeah. you know, you could just all of a sudden you know, they were listening, but they weren't it wasn't the look, you know, that right the right look I was looking for. And then all of a sudden, so I switched it over just a little. And then all of a sudden you, you, you saw their eyes pop and you saw that, you know, they were they kind of moved forward a little bit. So then it was like, OK, the group likes this, you know, so because you never know, you could be with, you could do groups of women, but you could, you know, one, one audience could be completely different than the other audience, you know, yeah. you really have to pay attention to, to the, to the, the body language, especially, you know. And, and sometimes you find groups uh, where there are people who've got a lot of influence within the group. Yes, that's very true. And actually, they may wield more influence with the group than you. And you kind of have to work out, you know, where, where, are, the, where are the eyes going whilst yeah. I'm who, you know, I, I work with a mobile phone company and it was six people and their boss. <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing a, a, a day workshop. Every question I asked, everyone looked at the boss. Oh, how funny. Oh, Looking no, for she, approval. <laughs> Yeah, totally. And and so I kind of had to go like, what's going on here? Because n nobody's, n nobody's speaking with, a, with any honesty because they're afraid of what someone might think. Right. So I, you know, I said to her, can I have some time with you people? <laughs> <laughs> No, so we can work out what's going on because they're just they're just on their best behavior, which yeah. means they're not listening and they're not communicating That's with tough. each other, with me, with any kind of honesty. And you, you know, you've invested money. You want something to work here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know? That's a tough situation yeah. to be in because if they're yes. more concerned about what the person thinks, then you know, and they're not showing you true honesty. You're kind of you're you're kind of trapped in a situation where it's not going to evolve into something good unless you know that that fear kind of dissolves itself. Yeah, 
And you mean that happens a lot in companies, and you need to get people away from the from those people who potentially could sink what it is you're doing without necessarily meaning to do it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now you wrote a book about. Now, yes. so you recently wrote a book. I want to hear more about this book too. I, uh, I, uh, uh, there it is. <laughs> be seen, be worth. Uh, be no. Be seen, be heard. Get paid what you are worth. I like that. Tell us about and it. My little subtitle here: from invisible to superstar. Wow. Um, and so, in the book, I take people through the reader through what it would be like to work with me for six months. Mm -hmm. So we get the whole process uh, and we, we start with the posture and the voice and the energy. Those are the three uh, pillars of being in charge of your impact uh, in any room with any people. So we always start there. Once we've got past that point and people like, you know, people can breathe. Yeah. I, remember, I, had, I had a client once who ran a telecoms company and she came to me and we did some Alexander technique and I got her breathing in the stomach. She said, I've never, ever in my life done this. Really? She'd spent her whole life breathing from the chest. Yeah. So her whole life was a state of anxiety. And so it, it wasn't just from a, you know, and she'd approached me from a speaking perspective. Right. It changed the entirety of her life. I believe it. It changed how she was with her young children. It changed the relationship between her and her ex-husband because whilst she, they'd been together, she was always in this state of anxiety. Yeah. Oh my God, completely different person. So that's kind of the starting point. Then we start working on what is the actual impact? Let's get specific. You know, what do you want to have at the end of this, uh, these six months? Right. Um, I, go I go through a process with them. I, I use a, a, a tool called Understand Myself, mm -hmm. um, which is a questionnaire that identifies the five malleable areas of personality. Yeah. And, and gives people a sense of where they are on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at that from the... Uh, from the perspective, the social science, if you like, of, of this is there are two particular areas in those five malleable areas that are, are, are of interest to me. Uh, and one is conscientiousness. Yeah. How, how hard are you willing to work? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to work when you don't want to? Right. On the basis that your life will be better tomorrow right if you do right now here's the interesting thing there's no there's no difference between men and women when it comes to conscientiousness they're both equally likely to be conscientious mm. but then we also look at the score for agreeableness now the women are typically 20 percent more agreeable than men so the average score of 100 people for, for women will be 61 and the average score for 100 men will be 41. Wow. I see and, that. Mm -hmm. And what you find is, this is particularly in the corporate world, what you find is you, I, I work with a lot of women who are really high conscientious and really high agreeable. What it means is they pick up a lot of work that they don't get credit for that's being delivered to them by men who are really conscientious and really low agreeable. Oh, okay. Which, which is which is why a lot of men get promotions more easily. Like any law firm in in any country, all the all the men will walk into the boss's office and go, "Pay me more every six months. Pay me more." They they might get a yes and they might get a no. Right. All the women will go. I couldn't do that. Oh, really? Wow. So a lot of the work is like, let's get that agreeableness scored down. They're like, hell yeah, let's get that agreeableness scored down. Yeah, you yeah. Know, not, not so much that you're unpleasant, but in, enough for people to see you as a credible force for change. Yes. 
right? Because the number of times that companies rung me and go, oh, we'd love you to work with Kate because Kate's lovely, but she's, we really like her, but she's really lightweight. Mm. How, <laughs> really? Honestly, yeah, we can't put her in front of state senior stakeholders because she's really lightweight. <laughs> and she's nothing of the sort when you actually meet Kate or me. Right. Who, do you know what I mean? It's like, they but somehow, it. what they've done is they've let people see or hear that. Mm -hmm. So if we want, well, if we want to get that agreeableness down, we're going to have to work on your warrior voice. Yeah. We're going to have to build those notes. And an example I often use is uh, Margaret Thatcher, the first British uh, premier to work with a voice coach, lowered her voice by an octave. It's almost unheard of. <laughs> the level of work she did to lower that voice. Wow. In order to control an all male cabinet. Wow. And in 1979, 3% of Britain's parliament was female. And the prime minister happened to be one of them. But she went in with a hard voice up here. Yeah, yeah. Right? And it's, it's all on YouTube. You can see that how she went in in 79 to Downing Street and, and let, let us bring light. <laughs> and then she found, she found she had a full all-male cabinet who just did what the hell they wanted. Mm. And so she went, okay, she got herself a voice coach, she lowered that voice, and she used it to win her second term. Wow. Because she was, she was in real trouble before that election, and people yeah. don't remember that. But, uh, you know, then suddenly the ladies not for turning is the speech that people remember the, the most. Hell, and, and, and that... And, and what's funny is at the time, all the satirists started then characterizing her as a man, mm -hmm. you know, a woman who wears a man's suit. Um, yeah. it, interesting that, but she, she got what she wanted. She got the outcome. Yes. Now, my thing is, what a shame that that then became the only voice that she used. Mm -hmm. If you use the whole voice. <laughs> right, right then what happens is you become authentic to who you are with everyone you meet, but you've, you've got this, you've got this voice at your disposal. Right, right, right. Right. It gives you flexibility, flexibility in how others see you and how you can choose to be seen yeah. by others. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I often ask a client, in, in the corporate space, I say, look, let's go into your boss's office. You do it. I can't do it because I'm not in the company, but go into your boss's office and don't ask for the money. But what you ask is, look, if I come in here in six months time and ask for more money, what do you need to see? What do you need to hear that means it would be a no brainer for you to say yes? And what happens with that question is it's so precise that people start giving you truthful feedback. Yes. It's like you've given them permission to actually tell you something you need to know. Wow. Because people, in, in, often people are terrible with giving feedback. Yes. Because, because the questions we ask aren't nearly good enough. Yes. But if we make it specific, then people go, oh, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. And that's how we mainly find out what, what are we doing over the next six months? Well. We're going to show them what they need to see and hear. Right. So that you're going to go in in six months and say, you know, 30%, please. Mm -hmm. Or 40%, please, whatever it is. And, you know, we want you to get it because they see and hear someone of value that extends far beyond the pay rise itself. Wow. I like that advice. You know, most people... First, are fearful to go in the office and ask. And then yeah. second of all, they don't ask the right questions, like you say. But if you go in there and you're not asking for money right away, but you're asking, what do you need to see in me in the next six months in order to receive a pay raise? You know, yeah. then they will give you honest feedback. And that actually can guide you to success and elevation in your in the business world.
and probably gain you more confidence once you achieve it. Yes, exactly. And then you start finding out where people value you already. And you also start finding out what you need to work on. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, if I were to ask a client, find out what values people attribute to you. Mm -hmm. You know, or uh, even a, a business owner, find, find out what your clients value about right. you, about being in a room with you. Uh, and, and they will, they'll get good quality information. Right. But they'll also hear what words are not being used and they go, oh, mm -hmm. right. I, I th thought they might say that. Right. Well, we need to build that if you want people to say that. Right. What does that look like? What does that sound like? Right. Exactly. Exactly. No. I love it. Then, then we can chart that, chart that journey. And certainly with entrepreneurs, you know, um, I, the, my, my publisher is now my business partner. So what we've done is we, uh, we've incorporated the publishing within Speak to Shine as a company, which means an expert's book mm -hmm. uh, is something that, that we now do. Right. So we can help people give, we can give people a, a voice in the written word. Right. And then we can help them with a voice with the spoken word as well. Because can you imagine it, if you were to say, spend six months creating a book, we, we get the book out, we, we get it to the number one on Amazon. We, we create a book launch event where you can speak, where we can take lots of video content of you being amazing on a stage. Right. You know, and we coach you to be that level of confident, strong, authentic, yes. amazing, passionate mm -hmm. on a stage. Now, now we've easily got the next three months marketing content all sorted that one afternoon, right? And we invite, we invite your clients, we invite your prospective clients, we invite your friends, we, we find a really cool venue, we make it the most amazing experience for everyone who is there. Yeah. Then we start going, okay, well, would you like, would you like to do that on a TEDx stage? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that a TEDx stage is probably the highest level of credibility that an entrepreneur can have? Yes, most people agree that that's the case. Yes. Now, the thing is that 95% of people who do a TEDx stick it on YouTube and that's that. Mm. So actually they don't leverage the asset that you get having right. done it. So there's a process of, I can't, I can't guarantee people a TEDx, but I can work with them to create something that's most likely to be accepted by some of, or at least one of the organizers that I'm working with, assuming the topic fits the topic that they want to play with. Right. And, and again, we always do this from a perspective of generosity, because you know, the rule with Ted, Ted is you're not selling. Yes. So it's always about sharing. Mm -hmm. And again, that's the value of it. It's not a sales tool. It's a marketing tool. And exactly. the fact that you're not selling is brilliant when you're living in a buyer's world, mm -hmm. buyer's marketplace. Again, yes. all of that makes people feel safe. And then it's all about, we'll leverage that to help you grow your personal brand yeah. alongside your business brand, you know? Right. No, this is, it, it's a, it's, it's wonderful. You know, I, I think so many people have, everybody has a story. Everybody can learn from everybody and the yes. ability to share our stories the right way. I think it is, is, you know, we were talking before the show, the wisdom of words are, are so powerful when they're used properly. And, you know, and, and that's where the voice comes in and, you know, yes. and the body language and, and all those things put together as one, the enthusiasm, the, the different levels of your voice, you know, how you present yourself, all those things could not only um, attract people, but you could change lives. You know, you could really motivate others to want to be better or you, you're the light bulb goes off and someone who had a question and didn't know, you know, how to solve something in their life, you might have the answer for them. So it, there is a million things that could, that could happen. And, and, you know, people will take you more seriously 
if you project your voice properly, if you project your body language properly, if you say things the right way, you know, and we were talking before the show, you said, you know, you, when you use the metaphor chicken to people, what does it mean to you? The whole classroom yeah. has a different answer. So, sure. it's, yeah. so, you know, everybody perceives things differently, but if we learn the proper ways to exemplify our behaviors and our voice, you know, magic could happen, you know, in many ways for many different reasons. So I, I think what you're doing is amazing. Now, your book, where can people find your book? On Amazon. Oh, excellent. It's on Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk, Amazon.it, Amazon.de. It's on all the Amazons, definitely. <laughs> but uh, um, that would be, yes, the best place to get a hold of the book. And if, if it's all right with you, what I'd love to do is offer, I, I did a, a training on the uh, stage at the University of Glasgow last uh, last autumn. And what I thought I'd do is I'd put it online as a free training. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I'd, I'd love to share that with your audience if yes. you're comfortable doing that. Oh, I would love that. Yeah. Uh, and it's at the end of the free training, there is an opportunity if people want to, to have a half hour of complimentary uh, coaching with me. Oh, that's excellent. We'll put that in the description with their, with the link where they can find it. That way they'll be able to, you know, um, to see it and sign up and, and be able to, and to, uh, to, to uh, experience it. So definitely. And I do a lot of these calls. Uh, many of them do not become clients. So I don't sell unless somebody specifically would like me to. Right, right. Buy the market. So it's like, why don't we spend some time together and then we can work out whether we want to spend some more time together and it doesn't matter either way. Exactly, exactly. I love it. Now, if you had to give a couple of takeaways from everything that we talked about today, what would you like to emphasize to the listeners today of some important factors that you feel can make an impact on them? Yes, super. Uh, and, and, and funnily enough, I've been, I've been thinking a, a lot about, um, uh, about Carl Jung and myth mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and which myth are are you choosing to live in all the different kind of archetypes of the, you know, the hero, or the trickster, or uh, the guru, or you know, there's 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 lots of them, and it, and, and I I saw, was lucky enough to be in the audience at the very last event that uh, that Sir Roger Moore did before his death. Mm. And he told a story where, when he was a young actor in Hollywood in the early fifties, and he was. Um, he was under contract to MGM and he was, wasn't doing very well. And they sent him to a voice coach <laughs> and he said, uh, you're six foot one. And, uh, and Sir Roger said, yeah. And in the voice coach said, why are you standing five foot seven? <laughs> and he straightened the spine, probably using the same exercise that I shared yeah. here. And he said, the moment I stood up at six foot one, I started playing the hero and mm -hmm. I never finished playing the hero. So what's possible for you if you stand to your truthful height? Right. And then what's possible for you when you can extend your voice and right. get access to your natural voice? I love that. Those are the things, really, yeah. And and then you particularly use that uh, use that warrior voice yeah. to make sure nobody dismisses you as being too nice. I like that because when you stand up, you feel confident, and when yeah. you use that warrior voice, you're professional, like you said, and yes. you exemplify professionalism and confidence, and that's yes. what people take seriously, especially in the in the working world. So. I think that's excellent advice. I like that a lot. Thank this, you. This has been amazing. Now, where can people find you? Where can people find you? So people can find me. I have uh, two different uh, web addresses. Um, speak to shine .uk okay. is, is one and davidroylance.com 
Roylance, R-O-Y-L-A-N-C-E.com is the other. Speak to Shine is for my entrepreneurs uh, and DavidRoylance.com is for employees who are looking for a promotion or, or work in the corporate space. Right, right. As well. And the best email address to get a hold of me on is hello at speaktoshine.uk. I love it. Oh my God. This has been amazing, David. I I have learned so much in this short period of time and everything was so interesting. And I just, I, I think you, you provided a world of, of information today that is very valuable. I think for everybody that everybody can apply to their life, even if they're not an entrepreneur, yeah, even, they even if they're not an entrepreneur, how, you can, you can change all of your relationships yes. with this because exactly. it allows you to resonate more honestly and uh and live a life actually yeah. live a life that you want to have exactly. I, I, I heard you say before, when uh, I, I first came came across uh, your podcast i heard you say that it, anything is possible for anyone yeah i truly believe that i think you know i think people underestimate themselves and they have to really they have to feel good about themselves that a lot of the exercises you just exemplified can make them feel good about themselves because when you have self-worth you have confidence and when you have confidence then you can you know once you feel good about yourself and you start accomplishing things you feel like the world is in the palm of your hands that really if you work hard enough you can achieve anything you want if you put your mind to it when everybody has that capability we just have to learn to use the proper tools to work it and be determined and use the resilience that's already in us and learn how to actually bring it out. Yes. This has been great. Thank you so much, David. I hope you'll be on the show again. I love talking to you. Oh, please. Yeah, I, I've, I've had the most amazing time. Uh, <laughs> I had a great time. I know you as well. So <laughs> this is uh, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. This has been wonderful. I, I, you know, thank you so much. You have a great day. I will. And you take care and to your audience too, of course. Thank you.